environmentalists. Not because some environmentalists might have good intentions, but largely because the results have been disastrous, especially for the poorest people around the world. One of the major examples of this is the move to remove DDT from Africa. Many people know DDT is the cheapest and most effective form of killing mosquitoes, and it largely eradicated malaria in North America and Europe. Nevertheless, when Rachel Carson made her book on DDT called Silent Spring, it had a chilling result around the world. Even though DDT never killed a single person, there was a mass movement to remove DDT from existence. That movement still exists today because many people don't want DDT used in Africa to kill mosquitoes. Sometimes they even tell African countries that are poor that they won't be able to receive food unless they promise not to use DDT. The result is that millions and millions of children die each year of malaria. <clears throat> Here, how the world works displays his typical myopic view of the world and his ignorance of evolution. To better illustrate this point, I've uh, pulled an excerpt from an awesome book. It's called Evolution, The Triumph of an Idea by Carl Zimmer. It is read by Peter Thomas, I believe. And uh, without further ado, a little lesson on coevolution. The way in which the evolution of one species drives the evolution of another, known as coevolution, is one of the most powerful forces shaping life. Coevolution is also responsible for creating much of life's diversity, as the spiraling coevolution of partners spawns millions of new species. Coevolution is also a fact that we ignore at our own peril. Every plant we depend on is co-evolving with intimate partners, both life-sustaining and life-destroying. If we alter their coevolutionary dance, we may have to pay a steep price. Insects have been co-evolving with the plants they eat for hundreds of millions of years. In the past few thousand years, we humans have suddenly altered their coevolution by domesticating plants and trying to keep insects from eating them. The swift development of resistance to pesticides is one of the most graphic cases of coevolution in action. In 1939, the Swiss chemist Paul Muller found that a compound of chlorine and hydrocarbons could kill insects more effectively than any previous pesticide. Dubbed DDT, it looked like a panacea. Cheap and easy to make, it could kill many species of insects and was stable enough to be stored for years. It could be used in small doses, and it didn't seem to pose any health risks to humans. Between 1941 and 1976, 4.5 million tons of DDT was produced, more than a pound for every man, woman, and child alive today. DDT was so powerful and cheap that farmers gave up old-fashioned ways of controlling pests, such as draining standing water or breeding resistant strains of crops. DDT certainly saved a great many lives and crops, but even in its early days, some scientists saw signs of its doom. In 1946, Swedish scientists discovered houseflies that could no longer be killed with DDT. By 1992, more than 500 species were resistant to DDT, and the number is still climbing. The quest to eradicate pests with DDT and similar poisons has been a colossal failure. Each year, more than two million tons of pesticides are used in the United States alone. Americans use 20 times more pesticides today than they did in 1945, even though the newest pesticides are up to 100 times more toxic. And yet, the fraction of crops lost to insects has risen from 7% to 13%, thanks in large part to the resistance insects have evolved. The failure of DDT has been an unplanned experiment in evolution, as compelling as Darwin's finches or the guppies of Trinidad. There's no question that DDT was a massive failure. The question still remains, what to do? What to do? So check out my next video. The video response to this one, uh, where uh, Carl Zimmer poses some, a pretty interesting uh, solution. Uh, one that I think you'll enjoy. So check out that video. Peace.